Uh, hi everyone, welcome at the GRN's webinar for this June. Today our webinar will focus on open licensing business models for publishers. The webinar is brought to you by the Global Reading Network, GRN, in collaboration with the Global Book Alliance. Today's webinar is dedicated to publishers and creators of children's literature who are exploring the benefits possibilities, challenges, and limitations for an open licensing business model. The webinar is intended to help publishers understand ways in which they can generate revenue through openly licensed materials. And for today, our target audience is publishers and content creators in the Africa region. The webinar will highlight on three main areas. One is evidence from research on open licensing business models and second, opportunities and challenges in applying open licensing in commercial publishing. And third, as a publisher, how can you get started applying open licensing? Our key presenters for today are Neil Butcher, David Waweru, and Sififelo Zuma. Our first presenter will be Neil Butcher. Neil Butcher is based in South Africa, from where he has provided policy and technical advice and support to a range of national and international clients regarding education planning, use of education technology, distance education, both as full-time employee at the South African Institute for Distance Education site from 1993 to 2001. And as a, and a, as a director of Nail Butcher and Associates since then, he has worked with various education institutions, including UNESCO, and Commonwealth of Learning, assisting with transformation and research efforts that focus on effectively harnessing the potential of distance education methods, education technology, and open education resources. Neil has traveled extensively through the developing world, conducting research on education policy, higher education, distance education, education management information system, and education technology, technology for a range of organizations, governments, and donors. He works with Open Education Resources Africa as the project's Open Education Resources Strategist and is also currently consulting to the World Bank on a range of projects, activities across several African countries and in Asia. You're welcome, Neil. Our second presenter, is Mr. Sifefelo Zuma. Sifefelo is a publisher and uh, he registered his own publishing business in South Africa in 2013. Before that, his work experience began as a childhood uh, development educator for five years, after which he, saw, he, he taught intermediate phase in the kingdom of Eswatin, teaching learners on technology and science. He started Abantwana Publishing with the focus of developing affordable educational publication of LA childhood development. Abantwana Publishing has worked uh, in various projects with World Bank, Rich Foundations, and uh, various departments of education, and uh, I think in, in South Africa. Tiffa Fellow, you are welcome, please. Our third presenter, is David Waweru. David Waweru has over 20 years experience in book publishing. Uh, he is a founder of For the Live Publishers and the chief learning officer at Will to Win, at Will to Win Global, a training and confirming and, and consulting team based in Nairobi, Kenya. David uh, is a publishing consultant with the Association for the Development of Education in Africa, ADEA and a member of EU UNESCO expert facility. Until recently, he was a director of the Stage Corporation Kenya Corporate Board and chairman of Kenya Publishers Association. David is also a writer. He is a creator of the Safari Adventure Series, a collection of leveled readers with exciting life skills, adventure stories. The series promotes a love of reading and boosts the reader's confidence while increasing comprehension and fluence. Uh, David is a chairperson, is a champion of reading 
and writing from early age, as well as for excellence in publishing. He also an MBA degree from Cutting Graduate School of Business, Cutting University, Western Australia. His articles on education, entrepreneurship, and leadership have been published widely in leading newspapers and international magazines. David, you are welcome. Thank you very and much. My, you. And also we have Linda Hubbard, uh, Senior Advisor of the Global Book Alliance, who we are co-hosting this webinar. Linda will provide opening remarks and the closing remarks for this webinar. Welcome, Linda. And, and my Thank name you. is Ashtar Kalimo from Reading Within Reach and Global Reading Network. I'll be moderating this webinar. Again, on behalf of GRN and GDA, I welcome you all, and I hope you will enjoy the webinar. For all participants, if we have any technology question, you will type uh, in the chat box and we will address it as soon as possible. And if it is a question to the speakers, type them in the question and answers box, and we will gather them and address them in the meet at the, and at the end of this presentation. So after the first presentation, we will break for five minutes for questions and answers, and we will move ahead with the two presentations. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have another session for questions and answers. So we encourage all participants, if they have questions, please send them to the panelists so that they can be answered uh, in this webinar. So I would like to welcome Linda. Linda, welcome for the opening remarks. Great, thank you so much, Limo, and welcome everyone to this webinar. We are so delighted to have you on the call. Um, I think it's an incredibly important uh, topic that we want to really cover today, both from the perspective of open licensing as well as developing business models that can incorporate open licensing. Uh, we are delighted to have these three panelists. They are excellent experts and really looking forward to what they have to share today. But I would really encourage everyone to think of some, some key questions that you would like to ask these panelists since they are experts in their, their field, particularly in open licensing and business models for publishing. The Global Book Alliance is particularly interested in this uh, webinar and uh, delighted to support it and cooperate with uh, GRN on it because we, uh, as the Global Book Alliance a goal is to really uh, make books as accessible as possible to all children globally. We are looking for ways in which we can do that in the most effective way. And one of the things that we would really like to do is to encourage more open licensing so that more uh, ministries of education, more uh, district officials, more school, schools and teachers and parents have access to a, a much greater uh, number of materials that could be made available to them, especially in early grade reading. So I am delighted to, uh, to support this. And I'm sure we are going to learn a lot as we listen to these three panelists. And I'll be back uh, after they're completed. Over to you, Limo. Thank you, Linda, for a brief opening remarks. And now I would like to welcome Neil Butcher for his first presentation, for his presentation, which will focus on research that has been conducted on uh, open licensing business models. Uh, Neil, you are welcome, please. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, as you've heard, my name is Neil Butcher, and uh, I have been working in the field of open licensing and open educational resources, amongst other areas, for around about uh, 15 years or so, um, in my slightly longer career than that. Um, when I started my career or, or my work in open licensing, I was very excited about the educational possibilities of OER and I uh, spent quite a lot of time trying to formulate an understanding of what the educational potential of OER could be. But the more we engaged with the area and the field, the, the more concerned I became that the whole area of open licensing um, has not taken sufficient consideration of how to create sustainable new 
content creation industries, particularly in developing countries. Um, as you heard, I work mostly in Africa and uh, Asia. So my concern particularly is to make sure that the application of open licenses doesn't um, mistakenly undermine and destroy embryonic or, or uh, existing content creation industries, but rather helps them to make transformation that's uh, towards new business models um, in areas that are being disrupted through these processes of digitization. So just very briefly to start, uh, for those of you who, who are not so familiar with the concept, um, an open license is uh, not a license that will replace copyright. Uh, rather, open licenses, particularly the most commonly used one in the space of education, which is the Creative Commons licensing framework, uh, re substitutes all rights reserved copyright with what is called some rights reserved. Uh, and typically the rights that are being reserved in an open license are the right of attribution of the author to be recognized as the creator of the work and the rights of the copyright holder. Um, but the rights that are being given up most typically are first and foremost the right um, to, to, uh, to require permission from people before the content is being used. So when the license is modified, we grant people permission without uh, having to pay license fees or without having to request written permission to make copies of that work, which is obviously a very significant change for publishers. Um, and then the additional uh, modification that is typically allowed is very often a right of adaptation, which is granting other people to the right to adapt that work without having to request written permission. Uh, now, obviously, from an educational perspective, open licenses have very significant potential to bring the cost of uh, delivery of educational materials down, and they also hold some potential to allow local content creators to modify and adapt resources to make sure that they're relevant to different educational contexts. But on the other hand, they do pose a very significant and real threat to traditional publishing models. So what we were interested in doing as we got engaged in research in the early literacy space was to understand better exactly how open licensing is working and to assess whether or not there are any emerging business models that publishers can explore uh, to see whether or not they can start to transform their businesses to harness open licenses because open licenses are increasingly being demanded by both governments and donors for any content being created. Uh, and at the same time, to build sustainable, vibrant uh, local businesses. So in doing our research, the first thing that we identify, which I think is important to, to recognize, is that obviously there are many different kinds of storybook models at the early literacy level. A similar principle will apply at any other level, but um, just very briefly what we saw here is uh, we, we've identified three broad categories of, of storybooks. The first is basic storybooks, which are really about reading for enjoyment. The second is then leveled storybooks, which are much more explicitly designed to uh, take learners or uh, children on a journey of learning to read and developing their literacy skills. So obviously because of that, they tend to be more expensive to develop. And then the third category that we created is, is STEM storybooks. And the reason we created this as a separate category is that it's clear when um, content creators integrate science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects into stories, uh, which is being done quite often in early literacy, the cost of developing those stories tends to go up. So we felt it was important just to start by providing these categories because very often the people who are funding the development of early readers don't differentiate between them. And so they assume that every single type of storybook has a similar cost. But in fact, the reality is very different. We then, through a research process, obviously engaged a number of content creators, both commercial publishers and NGOs and government agencies, uh, and started to explore with them what their actual cost drivers were in creating stories of those kinds. So these are things that you'll presumably all be quite familiar with. Um, so there's writing fees, illustration, quality control, like editing and proofreading and design and layout. But then increasingly, we're also seeing that, you know, project management is a very significant cost often in creating stories um, and associated overhead costs of running an organization. And very often when people are costing the development of, of new stories, they don't take those costs into account. But obviously, if we want to create sustainable organizations, it's very important that we provide for the costs that are necessary to keep the organization going. And then in addition to that, as we move into this increasingly digital world and, and uh, 
when people are creating content, they're increasingly expecting that that content should be digitally available online somewhere. There are extra steps that are required to create that digital content in the form of EPUB or, or whatever other form is being used. And then to do the digital upload processes, depending on where one's uploading content to, that can be quite time consuming. And then also there's an important cost associated with curating that content online. Because it's one thing to post things online, but I think as we all know from engaging with the internet, unless there's ongoing investment in maintaining those content stores and repositories, they're not likely to be of much use to users. And then obviously finally, particularly importantly in the context of early literacy, are costs of translation, because very often there's a need to create stories in multiple languages, uh, and it can be uh, much more cost effective to translate stories than to develop them from scratch in, in each language. There are obviously concerns associated with that because translation is not always effective from one language to another. And so depending on the nature and complexity of translation, that can be a quite significant cost, which is very often underestimated when people are estimating or, or budgeting for content creation processes. As we went around and discussed with different content creators, and particularly as we were interested in trying to explore examples of people creating content under an open license. Uh, we, create, we, we identified four broad methods of content creation, which I've summarized briefly here. Obviously, everything that I'm presenting to you here is contained in a much more detailed um, research report, which the webinar organizers will circulate to you all once the webinar is complete. So the first model is the traditional publishing model. Um, and that follows very traditional publishing processes. So I'm not going to dwell in, in, in detail on that, um, although we have obviously documented it in the report. But then a second method that has gained a certain degree of popularity, particularly in the open licensing field, is what we just called the Book Dash method. And we call it that because it was pioneered by an organization called Book Dash. And then in that model, what happens is the organization, which is typically a nonprofit uh, in all the examples we've found so far, pulls together teams of volunteer authors, illustrators, designers, and editors who will sit together and create storybooks in a one-day bookmaking event. For early literacy level readers, that can quite often work very successfully. Although what we found in many instances is quite a lot of preparatory work is being done both by the volunteers and by the paid organizers who are in the NGO to prepare for that one day event. So even though we say it's a one day event, actually there's quite a lot more work that goes into the preparation of the event. And then also after the event, there will be quite a lot of work that's then done in the quality control, the editing and the layout and the finalization and preparation of that resource for distribution online. So again, even though it looks like a very cost effective model, there are quite a few hidden costs that we've identified that need to be unpacked. And the model has, in the instances that we've identified, depended very heavily on experts volunteering their skills into the process. So that's obviously great, and it's particularly um, good if the authors and illustrators are already people who have um, sort of viable careers where they're making enough money to be able to contribute their time voluntarily. But particularly in low-income countries, very often authors and illustrators are already struggling to survive, so it might be quite difficult to expect them to volunteer their time. A third model is then, uh, which is gaining a lot of interest, uh, African Storybook is using this model quite extensively as are other organizations, which is generating stories by communities, where communities can write the stories, um, drawing on local folk tales, fables, traditions, and contexts. And, and this is really a, a very important aspect of local content creation because uh, very often, particularly at the early literacy level, we've made the mistake of flooding markets with content that's been developed out of a, outside of a country. And that's often very alienating for, for young readers because they can't see themselves and their cultures and contexts in the stories. Whereas if communities play an active role in writing stories, then we can also ensure, in addition to the stories being in the, in, written correctly in the right languages, we can also ensure that those stories reflect something of the context of the readers, which is a very important aspect of developing early literacy skills. Um, the other key benefit of this approach is that it develops local talent um, because organizations can arrange workshops or training for those writers so that, that can help to develop their capacity and hopefully some of them can go on 
to make careers as authors or illustrators or whatever the case might be. Obviously, as you can imagine from what I'm describing, that's going to be a very much more expensive model because it's going to require intensive support and, and hands-on activities. And then the final method that we identified is what we call the software facilitated method. Uh, and, and this is gaining um, some currency. Uh, we've identified here African Storybook, Storyweaver and Bloom as just three examples of online platforms where people can actually come in of their own free will, create their own resources and content, uh, and then mount that content under an open license. Uh, again, typically, this is going to be done by people voluntarily. Um, but, very, but quite often, we're also seeing examples where funded projects are making use of these online platforms. And I mean, funded projects where someone other than African Storybook, Storyweaver or Bloom is receiving the funding. And they're then using the platform to create content. Um, and so that obviously has certain benefits because the content can be published online immediately. Um, but it does require additional skills and, and types of expertise. And even though very often it looks like creating content in software platforms should be much cheaper and easier, actually there are a lot of costs associated with that process. So what I've just done in this slide is illustrate very quickly, uh, you know, looking at the key cost drivers across the different methods. These are the, these are the different costs that you typically experience or encounter in each of the different four models. And in the report itself, we actually go into quite a lot of detail, unpacking what the costs of different models are so that people can get a feel for what it really costs to produce things. Uh, we do this because one of the key myths that is being propagated by many people um, when they talk about open licensing is the myth that content creation is basically free. And in fact, particularly in early literacy, but in all education spaces, uh, that myth really needs to be uh, demystified because the reality is that creating high quality content that's available in local languages and that draws on local content creation capacity to build sustainable industries in the long term requires significant investment. Uh, and so one of the things we're wanting to ensure with this research is that particularly funders and governments who really are the main drivers of content creation at early literacy levels in the developing world don't fall into the trap of thinking that because it's open licensing uh, that means the costs go down and they can reduce the amount of money they're spending on content creation. In fact, in, we believe that if you want to create sustainable uh, ecosystems using open licensing, you need to invest more heavily upfront in high quality content creation and then you'll reap the rewards of that over time as you go to scale. So obviously costs and, and individual costs depend on many different factors. So very often commercial publishers will have higher costs, particularly author and illustrator fees and royalties um, because they are commissioning people and paying for those services. Uh, local NGOs can have higher costs because they need to invest more heavily in com community capacity building efforts, developing their own capacity if they're still embryonic organizations. International NGOs, which are very often leading uh, Early literacy initiatives can have higher costs related to international salaries and a lot of the needs for travel. Writing fees can vary, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the key point that emerged from our research really first and foremost is, is to debunk the idea that it's, it's possible to kind of commoditize content creation and bring it down to say, you know, one reader costs this many dollars to create. It depends on a wide range of factors and depends on exactly what you're trying to achieve. So as we then went from that and looked at, at what that might mean for, for developing business models that could incorporate open licensing, the first key point that, that we think we'd like to make to publishers, whether they are non-profit or for-profit, is that you can't ignore these trends. Um, I, I do a lot of work in education around the world at all levels, uh, and I work a lot with governments and with donors, and it's very clear that there is a growing imperative to integrate the use of open licensing into education. Um, we can have long debates about whether that's good or bad um, for the publishing industry, for education, for the development of local cultural industries. But on the other hand, I think we also need to see that the writing is on the wall to a certain extent and accept that digitization is creating a very significant kind of disruption. And one of the key disruptions that it's creating is a massive pressure to integrate open licenses into educational content uh, in education systems around the world. So the first point that we would be making there is that publishers really do need to grapple with understanding how these paradigms are shifting and to innovate accordingly. Uh, 
And we hope that the research reports we've generated, while they don't try and tell you what you should do or, and don't come with ready packed answers, we hope that they'll help publishers to think about these issues. In the space of early literacy in the developing world, particularly in low income countries, we find still, and, and this has really nothing to do with whether licenses are open or closed, that most of the models depend on donor funding. Um, and, and this is no different from the past. Governments and donors are still the main funders of educational materials. Uh, that hasn't changed. The fact that they're introducing open licenses doesn't change where the main sources of funding come from. There are some small markets that exist for, for direct commercial sale of uh, early literacy materials, particularly in middle income countries. But, but in low income countries, those are almost non-existent. We feel that some of the open licensing models are showing promise. I, I think probably the, the main one is, is the one that combines content as a service. In other words, where the funder or government is willing to pay upfront uh, commercially realistic fees for the development of the content that is going to be openly licensed. So there's been a lot of arguments in some countries about governments trying to, to force publishers to release material they've already developed under open licenses, which I think is manifestly unfair from a business perspective. But on the other hand, if a government or donor is willing to commission a content creation exercise and is willing to pay fair market value for that, then I think that that's a more valid model. And as long as there's a sustained flow of uh, income into content creation in, in the long run, uh, that can actually create viable um, publishing industries, I think, over time, as long as those publishing industries are also diversifying their income stream. So, you know, other income streams might include the sale of printed openly licensed books. Um, so there are examples of that working successfully. Uh, at the level of early literacy, it might include delivery of teacher training services around the content that's being created, research and evaluation services, and so on and so forth. But I think also for publishers, it, it really does, particularly in African contexts, what this does illustrate very strongly is that those publishers who have been heavily dependent on sale of content into the education market really need to put a lot of effort into diversifying their publishing um, businesses and, and, and trying to build cultures of readership and, and content creation. So some of the discussions we've been having with publishers have been about how early literacy might be seen as a lost leader that helps to create the next generations of readers who might buy um, books commercially once they've become older and, and once they've developed a love of reading in their own language and in other languages. So, that diversification of funding could potentially enable specialized teams of publishing ex experts to remain sustainable. But the key point that we would want to make and, and which we make particularly to donors and to governments is that the business models that we've identified based on early open licensing are really very much in their infancy. So it's too, too soon to determine what's going to work most successfully. Um, and, and we think that there needs to be a lot of due care taken not to rush into new ways of doing things without making sure that the transitions happen successfully. Otherwise, a significant problem may be that well-intentioned efforts to get lots of uh, content in the hands of readers using open licenses may create much longer term problems of sustainability of content creation industries within countries. And I think in the long run, that's going to be very bad, uh, both for the education systems and for the cultural industries in those countries. So these are just a few examples um, of some of the business models that we've identified. Uh, the, the one is where content's available online for free, but you can print for a fee. Uh, second one is the use of volunteerism and, and then separately uh, combined with that, mobilizing resources from donors or from governments to support the organization that coordinates that effort. The third, which I've discussed already, is about the emergence of content as a service. And I do think that that's going to be a significant growth industry um, in this area, as long as we can persuade governments and donors to keep spending money on developing high quality content. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, also the value added services. In one or two instances, we've also found people mounting content on platforms like YouTube and being able to earn some revenue from advertising. So, so just as one or two examples, um, this one is uh, from India. Uh, it's an initiative called Story Weaver. Um, they have quite successfully, in fact, uh, deployed a, a model called online free print, print for a fee uh, and are able to actually compete successfully in tender processes to sell their content. I think it's very important to add to that, though, that for that model to have worked successfully, they've, revived, they've depended on a core base of donor funding to, to support the content creation and the maintenance of their platform.
Um, and then on that basis, they can actually uh, turn a small profit from selling printed resources at um, actually quite low costs, much, much lower uh, than their competitors. And so that model seems to have some promise as long as the upfront investment is there. A second model, which is, is just being piloted at the moment by an, uh, an American NGO called Room to Read, uh, it's being piloted in South Africa, focused on producing 20 stories in five South African languages, and each story was translated to every language. The, the idea was to then use the book da dash method to create uh, books and, and then to sort of get a mix and, and to see whether or not this could be used as a way to create new content that could then be released on open license, um, uh, but, but also we, where we could have content as a service. There's quite a lot of interesting lessons being learned from that particular project, um, and we are assisting with an evaluation. I think what, it, what this particular example is demonstrating is that it's quite difficult to uh, get existing publishers to transform this using this kind of model and still be able to be financially viable. So, so there is a significant challenge there. I've then described the book dash method at, at some length, but I think it is one that's worth just engaging with a bit and to understand better. The next example that I'm just putting up here is um, from the Maltina Institute for Language and Literacy. Um, in this particular instance, they have received upfront, upfront funding from uh, Zenex Foundation to create teaching and learning materials. So that's effectively selling content as a service. Um, they've released this under a, a non-commercial, no derivatives license, which means that people can't modify that content. Um, and they do that because they're, they're concerned that translations will undermine their leveled readers. Um, and then what they're doing is trying to build value added services around that in terms of things like teacher training, for example, using the, the track record that they developed through this to get new content creation commissions and actually also uh, using the print for a fee model. So, so I think this is an early example of something that does have potential to create something vibrant uh, at the early literacy level. But I think the key point here is that the services they're offering extend well past uh, those of a traditional publisher. So just in the interest of time, um, I've skipped over the last one, which is Sia Vula, which is also another example of funded content then being made available to a government department. You know, the, the key messages that have come from the research that we've done, first and foremost, is ha, ha, have been to try to debunk the myth that a lot of people who are proponents of OER and open licensing try to propagate. And, and that's the myth that content is effectively free and that therefore you don't have to worry about paying for it. Um, I think what our research has demonstrated very clearly is that there are a number of costs associated with the development and, and distribution of high quality content. And none of that changes just because licenses change or because content is digitized. Uh, and so one of the key things that we, we need to avoid is seeing, system, seeing environments in which governments, donors, and other funders uh, stop investing in content creation. Um, the other key message coming from our research is, is to take a kind of horses for courses approach, not assuming that there are one size fits all uh, approaches to how costing is done. Um, I do think that related to that for publishers themselves, it's becoming increasingly important to actually analyze um, the cost drivers. Uh, many of the organizations we were working with didn't really have a strong handle on exactly what costs what. Um, and, and, and we feel that that's quite an important thing to get to grips with, particularly if we're moving from sale of content as a product to the sale of content development services, you really need to know how much they cost and what it takes to be profitable. Um, and then it's also just relevant to see there that, that different open licensing models use different types of open licenses some are very open where you can copy and, tr and, and, and modify the content as much as you like and you can use it for commercial purposes. Others are very much more closed. And publishers really need to understand open licensing frameworks better. Many of them that we've engaged with don't really understand open licensing frameworks well at all. And so again, we would encourage publishers to spend time learning about this and understanding where the field is going because it is going to have a disruptive or it's already having a disruptive effect on their industries. But the kind of key message that emerged from our research, uh, we think, is that the dearth of lo local storybooks, particularly in low income countries, is going to continue if the funds from current initiatives are not reaching local stakeholders to create a legacy of high quality local content creators and support the growth of vibrant cultural industries within countries.
And this is something that certainly in the field of early literacy, we think is not receiving anything like the attention it ought to be. Key to the success and future of any developing country, in my opinion, is a vibrant cultural industry. It's something that's not getting nearly enough attention. Um, and so we believe that as we move to open licensing, we really have to, we have a, an obligation to make sure that the way in which we're investing in content creation is building that local capacity uh, and not just achieving short-term goals of delivering stories to learners uh, at the expense of the long-term sustainability of the publishing industry. So that's what we've learned so far. Um, and I hope that's been a useful introduction to the research that we've been doing. Thank you so much, Neil, for a wonderful presentation. And Neil, I could see there is one question already in the question and answers box. I'll answer Marion's question first. Um, so she's asking um, if a, a Creative Commons attribution, uh, non-commercial, non-derivative license, that's a license that doesn't allow people to use the content for commercial purposes or to modify it, is counter to OER as it undermines the reuse and remix potential. Um, so Marion, my, my view on this is that anyone who has very hard and fast views on anything like what license you should apply um, sounds more like a kind of uh, ideologue to me than a person who's trying to solve problems. Um, so I would say that, that in principle, uh, I think it's good to start with the most open licenses possible because they obviously create the most possibilities for reuse and adaptation. But I think, and I think the, the example of Maltina is a really excellent one where there are good cases to be made, not just from a commercial perspective, but actually from an educational perspective to not make licenses as open as they potentially might be. So, so that Maltina example where they didn't want to allow translation, um, is, is really about a, a, a philosophical belief in, in, in what it takes to create high quality level readers, which is that you have to develop from scratch in a language, not translate from one language to another because of the changes. Uh, because of the changes that the language make to the story and to the level of the, the words and everything else. And so I think in that instance is a really good argument to be made for not giving the most open license. And I, I would argue that anyone who thinks that that then undermines OER um, is kind of trying to push for uh, a purity of thought that I don't think is helpful in the real world. So, so I'm much more inclined to want to have a slightly more open and, and uh, uh, flexible perspective to those kinds of issues. Um, I think also just, just on that point that, that, that I would argue that, that if a content creation industry can be formed through all rights reserved copyright, and that's being done in context where there is no content creation industry, I think we have a responsibility to find ways to see if that's worth supporting. So I think we've got to be careful not to be dogmatic in our approach. So that's that question. I've got a longer question from Juliana, which I haven't been able to read yet. So, so Juliana is asking about um, whether it's uh, realistic to ask African publishers to leapfrog directly to these new business models while they're still kind of in their embryonic phases. And she's notice, noting that big publishers haven't been able to make this jump. Um, so, so why is it kind of fair um, to, to ask African publishers to make that kind of jump? And do I, do I think that the issues are the same or different in, in American or African publishing? So I think the first answer I would give to that question, Juliana, is that I think that very often those who are embryonic in many ways can evolve new business models much faster than the incumbents because the incumbents are, you know, have, have developed an entrenched way of doing business and they find change very difficult to manage. Um, so, so I'm not sure that it's a question of fairness or realistic to ask African publishers to leapfrog. I, I do think that African publishers, especially nascent or embryonic ones, actually have a potential to create new business models much more quickly because they aren't, uh, they don't have the old business models embedded in their way of doing things. Um, so, so I think that, but, but I do think that you're raising a very important point, which is, uh, that the, um, the expectation, placing expectation on African publishers that they must move to these business models may very well be unrealistic. In fact, that is for us a key finding from the research is that there aren't examples of business models that have demonstrated long-term sustainability yet. And so if we accept that, that part of our 
goal in early literacy is not just the short-term goal of delivering stories to young readers, but is actually building vibrant long-term content creation industries that will be sustainable in African countries. I think we have a responsibility to walk alongside those African publishers, to work with them, to help them to evaluate different approaches, to help them to develop capacity and to make sure um, that, that they create viable business models for themselves. And I think as part of that, we need to be very careful to avoid a dogmatism, as I said in responding to the previous question, that we impose a demand that they must move to open licensing exclusively. Uh, I think many publishers are going to strive uh, if they can create hybrid models where they create some content under all rights reserved copyright and some content as a service under open licensing. So I don't think it's a one size fits all model. And I think we do need to be very careful not to try and uh, impose particular business models on embryonic organizations, because I agree with you that that's not likely to help them. Um, the next one is from Tessa Welsh, who, who's just noting that the example I gave of Maltino could have um, had a double kind of option where the, their base readers were non-derivative, but there was a more open license uh, to adapt and reuse those resources as storybooks. Um, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, and I, I, I think the interesting question would be, um, if you've released a resource under two different models, how you then prevent uh, the bad practice from emerging. I do think to a certain extent, and I think this is linked to Tess's point, one of the difficult challenges that we face in the world of digitization is it's very difficult to stop people from doing things anymore if they decide they want to. So even though non-derivative licenses might be applied to, to books, there's actually, in many cases, not a lot you can do to stop people from adapting things and, and reusing them, particularly if they're using them off the radar. Um, and so I do think that, that, that we need to to accept it in a digital world becomes increasingly difficult to police what people do with your content and rather try and create the conditions in which they can use it most effectively as possible. Um, and maybe something along the lines that Tessie is suggesting would, would be an effective way of dealing with that. Thank you, Neil, for addressing those three questions. And now we are going to our second presentation by Sifa Fellow Zuma. So as I mentioned, uh, Sifa Fellow is going to share experience on the opportunities and challenges uh, existing in applying uh, open licensing, uh, especially with commercial publishers. He has a vast experience uh, in South Africa. So please, uh, Sifa, the floor is yours. Right. Thank you, Limo. Thank you, Limo. Um, um, to say thank you to Neil for a beautiful presentation. Um, it was very informative, so thank you very much, Neil. Also, to welcome the rest of the panelists. Um, it's, I think it's going to be a very interesting day to learn from expertise from different individuals within the fields of expertise. My name is Sipepe Lozuma. I'm currently uh, with Abadona Publishing. I am one of the directors. Um, I was privileged enough to be introduced to open licensing um, whilst I was using the traditional licensing model. So the presentation I'm going to be showing you will be a holistic um, approach to what our dollar publishing um, has engaged in in order to apply um, open licensing within the field of um, commercial, uh, sorry, commercial publishing. Um, I'm gonna focus specifically on the uh, scholastic environment, which means uh, mostly in the school publishing, um, because that's where I, I predominantly play. Um, my core business model is focused on only childhood development, uh, which we started off in 20, 2013, and have slowly grown um, to now end up at, um, and from intermediate into FET, into higher education. So that's what I'll be presenting on. So as you can see, um, I'll be talking about the opportunities and the challenges existing in applying open licensing to the scholastic environment, so in the school's environment. Right, so again, I welcome all of you, um, everyone that's participating. Um, it's great to see um, the involvement of creators and publishers, and even business people that are interested in going to the field of publishing. I am a teacher by trade, and I'm an early childhood development teacher. So I've been in the field of playing with educational toys and 
developing books for quite some time. Um, but now I decided to start my own publishing house at a very young age. So that's my background. And I'll start off with one of my greatest sayings, which I think I learned while I was busy in high school. And it says, to the world, you are somebody, but to somebody, you are the world. And the reason that I wanted to start off with this specific saying is because to me, that's the power of a book. Um, a book can mean something to one person, but can actually change the world. And I guess that is why we are here, and that is why we've got expert panelists, because whatever input they've put in to education through the books or through the research um, has actually had an impact to each and every one of us in terms of an educational level. I'll be targeting three key points. Um, I just want to switch off my video so that we can actually focus more on the slides, and then I'll put back my... Um, okay, no, it's fine. Um, so I'll be focusing on three key points. The first point is a situation of open licensing in a commercial publishing space within South Africa, and that's where I am based, or that's where Abandona Publishing is based. Second would be the opportunities of making profits using our open licensing model. This is where I'll be showing you um, the model that we've decided to use um, as a company and as an organization. The third point would be the current challenges and the recommendations that we have as Abandona Publishing. So I'll start off and I'll pose a question. And I'll say, what role does open licensing play in commercial publishing in terms of the school sector? And I'll just give you a, a, a brief round, a run, um, just in terms of the environment, and then I'll actually zone in um, to answering the question. I'll start off with the South African situation in terms of commercial publishing. Um, in South Africa, we've got 12 official languages, which I think have increased now to um, to 14, actually, with sign language also now being one of them. And um, I think it's Mandarin being the 14th one, but I'm speaking on the, on the 12th. You will see that English um, is still predominantly the strongest. It just clouds over 50%, with Afrikaans at over 40, at, uh, sorry, over 30% at about 35%. And then the rest, which I actually highlighted in blue, or the blue bars, that's what we call indigenous languages within our South African space. So those are our native languages. And you can see that in terms of the native languages versus the, the European language, which is English, that um, it's actually um, the publications or the revenue are actually very small on the, um, in the indigenous languages spectrum. And that is where Avantgarde decided to play. So our core focus when we, when we founded the, the, the company was to actually start playing strongly in terms of indigenous languages, promoting indigenous languages. In terms of the markets of publishing within South African space, um, we've got different um, departments which play different roles within the South African space. We've got our department of basic education. Those cater roughly for, for learners between 12 months and all the way up to grade 12. Um, so we're talking about schools, we're talking about creches, which obviously accommodate the, our, our litanies just below grade RR. You talk about our early childhood development centers, um, which from there it's usually primary schools and in, into high schools. So that's the space that the Department of Basic Education in terms of South Africa plays. In terms of the budget allocation, 60% of the national budget allocation usually goes up to what we call LTSM. If I have to break it up, it's called a learner teacher support material. So that is, for example, um, textbooks and books and posters and all the resources that a class and a learner would need and a teacher would need in order to be able to execute the learning. 12% goes to what we call teacher training, which is obviously a training um, individuals who want to enter into the field of education. And as you can see also bursaries, which is obviously giving bursaries to, 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 to learners. 38% goes into infrastructure. That is the, that is the development um, of new schools and new sites. And that is the basic spread of the basic education. Now, just to highlight that we are talking in this conference, on this webinar, we are focusing mainly on um, readers, early childhood readers. So I'll be mostly focusing on the basic education um, sector. But I just wanted to give you a runabout of how the markets look in terms of South Africa, in terms of publishing. The second sector, as you'll notice, is the Department of Higher Education, which now is called Higher Education Science and Technology. 
This caters for our learners who are, under, who are undergraduates and also postgraduates. Here you look at your, com of your community learning centers, your TVIP colleges, your universities, and your learning institutions. And with that, our LTSM spread goes a bit less than 60%. It's now gone to 40%, with the emphasis starting to grow on the teacher learning, as you can see with 22% going to teacher training and bursaries. It still remains the same for the infrastructure, which is at 38%. The Department of Sports uh, and Recreation and also the Department of Social Development, their key focus in South Africa is to cater for the, recreation, the recreational needs um, of um, its communities. So in terms of the publishing space, they usually look at our school libraries and also our public libraries. In terms of the national financial spread, that we, it's only 12% that's actually allocated into publishing space. And then the other markets, which is, as Neil has um, touched, touched on, is the NGOs, it's in, the, in international grants and funding, tenders, which you can receive from the country, and other private entities and companies and organizations. Now I'm going to zone in to open licensing within the market of basic education where our early readers play. So if I look at the 100% allocation budget of the LTSM, I see that 75% is within what we call the traditional publishing model, which I think Neil has also touched on which is what usually our big publishers are playing. So it's usually the textual, the textbooks, et cetera. 25% has been an initiative from government to start what we call ITC schools, which are schools that are gonna be innovative schools that are dealing in STEM education, that are dealing in innovation and also in technology. 10% is on the e-content model, where the department is actually planning now to actually develop e-content um, on a wider spread. Um, but now the funniest part of all of this is that only 9% of all of this 100% is actually spent on open licensing in the, within the South African spectrum. But you ask yourself a question, how is it spent or, 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 or what is the open, open licensing model that they are trying to, to create in South Africa? The first one is they've actually planned to construct or maybe it's underway, the construction of a basic education website platform. So it'll be like the e-commerce version where publishers, whether small or SMME, small publishers, or large uh, publishers are able to actually now submit through their materials on an, an, on an online basis for schools to access them. This model was created mainly for the ITC schools because they were piloting the use of e-publications for those schools and integrating them with STEM and robotics, which is what the, the, the ITC spectrum was trying to do. The second one is actually that um, the department has started to develop curriculum material under open licensing, but, main, but mainly focus on mathematics, literacy, and life orientation. Those being what we call the critical subjects um, as there's a need for, for more mathematical literacy and life orientation. And unfortunately, I see science is also not here, but science also does play a big role in it. And you'll notice that the department has started investing heavily within the sector of grade R up to grade six. So it's just different materials that have been created, um, learner books, teacher guides in that space. So then this means that in short, open licensing in South Africa, 9% nationally is actually really focused at spending on, in terms of actually broadening this, the spectrum of open licensing. This will go to my second question. And my second question is, is there a possibility of actually making a profit with open licensing in South Africa? So is there a possibility for me as a publisher to actually make money with open licensing? And I'll go back to the markets that I had previously um, highlighted to you guys. So before this, Abadona Publishing was strongly using the old model. So now we had to look at how we can diversify now using this open, new, new open licensing. In short, we had to now still follow the same rule as Neil had mentioned, where that the copyright holder, so the person that creates the material, still owns the material, but then now we had to look at different ways on how to use it on an open licensing. Now, the beauty of open license is that it's, you are able to use material. You can share it, you can remix it, 
just uh, or you can even commercialize it so that you can actually create a different model and you can compete even with the traditional model. So Avantrana then decided to, to use this specific model. We are very privileged to be linked with a room to read, as Neil had actually put um, uh, on, the, on his previous slide. So this is a model that we felt we, we adopted very well, simply because, as it's highlighted here, um, it, we're using the CC BY um, open licensing. And then there's, there's just a couple of reasons why, and I'll highlight them to you quickly. Mostly, um, funders really do approve of the CC BY. It's because of the flexibility of the license. So you can actually receive quite a lot of funding or products through using CC BY or using open licensing, which is a nice revenue stream. So that's where you can start making your first profit. Also, other publishers are able to use your titles and develop other titles. We found this quite important when working with groups of publishers. Um, as an emerging publisher, it's very good to create those relationships with other publishers, um, especially publishers that are playing in the same space as you, which are trying to also play in the same space of open licensing. So by us actually enabling our titles to be shared by other similar publishers, we're creating a relationship amongst those publishers. And in, in that way, whenever they create their own content, we are all able to actually share in the development cost, and we're also able to share in terms of the marketing approach that we would have um, as a collective and not as an individual publisher. And also, as Neil had also highlighted, that with open licensing, there's a lot of uh, license, um, I won't really call them issues, but there's a lot of licensing knowledge that you must have. And I guess with the CC BY, it's very flexible. So it allows you to really run away from conflicting in terms of violating any sort of license. Um, because it's, 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 it's so flexible in its approach. And for us to be able to do this as Abandona Publishing, we couldn't have done it alone. Uh, we actually had to, to gain a lot of training and we actually had to seek expertise. And we were lucky, like I said, to actually have this training um, or having a training institution or, or, or trainers to assist us. And that was room to read. Um, so they really did assist us to actually educate us about the specific um, open licensing. These were just a couple of titles that were created by ourselves and other publishers. Um, as you will see there, they, they're in the English version. Um, we were able to version them, I think, to five different languages. So this is just a couple of them, um, which this, this experience was very enlightening. Uh, we we're able to do the, the model where we could create a book in a day and it was enlightening to see illustrators and creators and um, even editors in the same space working together to execute a book or a title within one day. Right, so making the profits. So how did we then make profits after we created these books? We had to look at our different markets and we first looked at our early, because these were all early readers. We looked mostly at the Department of Basic Education. But now, when you are dealing with a department of basic education, you have to comply with specific regulations. And one of those regulations was that we had to, whatever material that you must submit must comply with the curriculum of the country. So we had to take those specific titles that we had created with other publishers. We had to look at them and even adapt them slightly so that they can be able to be curriculum rich and actually be able to be approved by the department. Currently in South Africa, we've got a, we've got a couple of curriculums running both at a private institution level and at a government level. We've got our Cambridge, we've got our Montessori, uh, which are mostly in our private sector um, of education. Then we've got our CAPS, which is our national, which is our national curriculum. We've got SPC that we started to deal with, which is mostly dealt um, in terms of the kingdom of Eswatini. So that's the national curriculum. So we took those titles, we aligned them to the curriculum, and then we're able to actually input them within the, those books. So at the back pages, we're able to put the learning outcomes and the, and the uni standards that the, the learner would reach or the learner would, would explore whilst using our books. So once we had done that, we had to submit our books through to provincial and national catalogs. So what happens in South Africa is that um, we have to submit the books for them to be screened by specialists, um, usually curriculum specialists, once the books get approved, the schools then are able to order those books. 
um, because they've been approved material. And that was our first revenue stream. So we took those books, we translate them, we, 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 we made them curriculumly, we aligned them to the curriculum. We then also um, diverge them in terms of the um, different languages that, that we scope. The second was we started to create what we call foundation phase kits. Now, because we're talking about early readers, we're talking about from grade R over to grade three and even lower for some, for some countries. So we started creating kits which were integrated to add value to the teaching element of um, on early childhood development. So what we did is we created kits that had inside the, the kit box activity books, readers, posters, and even educational toys, where if a grade R teacher has got that kit, they can holistically approach their teaching environment in all key subject areas. Um, we then went to the Department of, of Sports and Recreation. If you remember my previous slide, um, the sports, sports and recreation focuses on school libraries. The beauty of, of, of the sports and recreation is that because they're not curriculum, uh, they're not aligned to the curriculum, we were able to, to directly put through our books. So with that, we approached the other publishers that we had worked with, and then we actually submitted, as Avantuana, we then submitted those titles on their behalf also. So this kept the relationship amongst the publishers because now we're able to market other publishers and market ourselves and still be able to create a revenue stream for all the publishers involved. Um, with the Department of Bioeducation, Science and Technology, we changed our approach a bit. Uh, we, we then had to look at the element of the teacher training element. So what we then did do, we, we, we actually partnered with a training service provider in the early childhood development. So what used to happen is that, um, or what happens is that the training service provider conducts the training on behalf of Abandoana. Then what we then do is then we supply what we call the start up kit to the newly accredited educators. So the educator is able to get, at the end of graduating, they're able to get a little startup resource kit, which inside will have um, activity books, will have some readers, will have some classroom resources like posters, and charts, etc., and we'll have even lesson plans where the, where the educator is actually even able to actually teach from day one using that lesson plan all the way up to the last day of school. So those are all done, again, using open licensing so that anyone who can access it through our portals is able to do so. So what are the current challenges and recommendations that we have? Um, as we know that there are a lot of challenges in publishing, especially if you're competing with the, with the bigger publishers your Macmillans, your Pearsons, et cetera, et cetera. So as a small entity, we did have quite a lot of challenges. And I just highlighted a couple of them. Um, obviously, we'd never finish the slide if we had to discuss on how many challenges that you face as, a, as an emerging publisher. So this was just a couple. So the first challenges that we faced, or maybe that South African publishers can face, is that, the South African, um, that in South Africa, the open licensing model is, is, is very limited in terms of exposure. As you had seen in my previous slide, that only 9% of open licensing is even exposed at a national level. So a lot of, in terms of public, um, commercial publishing, there's lack of exposure in terms of the open licensing model. So the more we actually create content and the more we actually challenge the, the, the old model in terms of the markets, the more exposure that we could receive. Second of all was the training. We noticed that with open licensing, you really have to have a lot of training in order to understand um, what open licensing means and which components you can actually use in terms of your publication space. Because as Neil had highlighted, some will allow you to remix or, or, or some will not even allow you to even sell the content, et cetera, et cetera. So you really as a publisher have to get research into it, read about the open licensing and what it means to you and your organization. Thirdly, we discovered that because of the old traditional model, a lot of authors, illustrators, and even the editors did not understand the new model. So usually in the old model, what used to happen is that the authors themselves used to get what we call royalties. So for every sale upon a book, they would see maybe let's say a percentage. But now because you're using an, using an open licensing, Sometimes they had to just 
create the work and then the work would still would belong to the publisher without them getting royalty. So a work for hire, um, which was a model that they didn't understand. So even with that, we had to also um, train them and educate them about those specific new models that they could also be facing. And, or, and then the third point is the marketing. Um, with, with, I think with the traditional publishing, marketing was a bit easier because it was a proven, it's a proven market. So it's a proven market and the models were created and all the publishers have been benefiting from that. With a new model, you actually have to find more advertising and your, your, marketing, your, your marketing approach has to change. It has to be more digital now. You have to use more social media, et cetera, et cetera. So your marketing approach has to really change versus the traditional approach. And obviously finding new avenues of market um, because the beauty of open licensing is that the grants and the funds really welcome the open market, I mean the open licensing. So those are a new markets that usually the, the traditional players or the traditional publishers cannot, they don't really play well in because of obviously they've got, they own, um, they've got a closed license. So those are a new markets, the ones where you can go for international grants, um, even go to different platforms as, as some of the, our panelists um, have, have um, I'm sure I'm going to highlight. Our recommendations, um, creating partnership with other um, open licensing publishers has really benefited us. We've created a relationship, I think, with over now eight publishers in the open licensing space. And, and where we are able to share ideas, we're able to, to, to call each other for marketing ideas. We're able to assist each other in terms of costing of our materials. We're able to actually assist each other even in terms of development. Um, so, the, so the relationship with other smaller publishers has really helped Abandona grow. The second point is the relationship with printing companies. We have noticed that even though we are going to a digital bit, sorry, um, publishing is going to, to becoming digital, that in South Africa, there's still a very strong need for, for, for printed goods. So your textbooks, your books still to be printed. So having a good relationship with, pub, uh, with printers is also very key because then with, if you have a good relationship with, with your printing companies, you're able to get great discounts, even depending on the quantities that you're able to print. The third recommendation would be online portals. Um, the e-publications are becoming more and more popular. Uh, and we've noticed that, especially with the open licensing, it, it, it creates a very nice avenue to be able to market yourself or to even sell your content at a very cheap price, a very competitive price um, on an on a e-commerce or e-learning platform. So we'd actually encourage publishers who want to enter to the space to actually maybe even consolidate and create an e-commerce an e-learning platform where they can sell their books for cheaper. And then the fourth point is actually to find a relationship between the traditional model and the new, which is the new model for open licensing. Um, we've noticed that we've had to actually also um, sometimes play on both sides. Sometimes we've had to use the open licensing on some occasion Sometimes we've had to use the tr traditional model on other cases for revenue stream. And we've seen that there's actually a lot of similar trends in terms of the market, but you just have to see how to play it. So it's very important to actually look for those links between the two, between the traditional model and the new model, and then see a new way to market your goods. And then the last one is just to see the different grants and the different fundings that are available whilst you are using your open licensing. And yeah, so that will, that's my presentation. And I'd like to thank you all for participating today. And I would just like to give credit to a couple of organizations who have, I think, assisted me. And I think some of them are also part of the, um, part of the organizers today. So I'd like to give thanks to Room to Read, to Reach Foundation, to Global um, Reading Network, to PASA, and to, US, to USAID um, for assisting us. And I think also just to guiding us on how we can move forward in terms of open licensing. So I thank you very much. And Limo, back to you, my man. Thank you so much, Sife, for the great experience you have shared. We are going to listen to another presentation to share experience with publishers on how, uh, what should be considered uh, before you get uh, into applying open licensing materials, open licensing to the materials you are, you are creating.
David, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Limo, and uh, greetings to all of you. So we will go through just about six uh, topics in the next couple of minutes. And uh, the first thing that I would like us to consider, although um, it's already been mentioned, is to have a quick overview of uh, copyright and its contribution, uh, the contribution of the copyright-related industries uh, and particularly publishing uh, to the global GDP and uh, to the economies uh, around the world. The second topic we will consider is uh, whether publishers should really consider open content licensing. And I think as uh, one of the uh, participants asked, uh, particularly given that uh, publishers in Africa are still uh, in the nascent, nascent stages, and I'd like us to probably go back to that question. Uh, the third topic we will uh, discuss is, uh, should publishers then make that decision to apply open content licensing? What are some of the decisions that uh, they need to make uh, you know, before they apply open, uh, open licensing? Uh, the fourth topic we will consider is uh, basically uh, the type of, uh, open content licenses commonly used by commercial publishers. And uh, finally, uh, what principles uh, that would guide the selection of titles for open content licensing. And I will end up with uh, just about three recommendations. Uh, perhaps we could look at the first and probably the only global map for the cultural industries within which publishing uh, is, is a very prominent uh, industry. And uh, this report was by Ernst and Young. It's a 2015 uh, report that basically showed that the global contribution of the cultural and creative industries was $2.25 trillion. And it employed about 30 million people um, uh, around the world. And out of this, uh, book publishing contributed one, over $143 billion uh, to the global GDP. And it employed uh, 3.65 million, uh, all within the book industry. And what this represents is just about 6.5% uh, of uh, uh, the, the financial contribution to GDP and 12.5% uh, of all employment within the, uh, the cultural and creative industries. And we would say, when you look around the world, the copyright related industries are very key drivers to economic growth, uh, to job creation, and, and basically to the general well being and health of nations. So they play quite a critical role. Having said that, uh, I think one of the things that uh, publishers, as publishers, we need to have a conversation within ourselves is the fact that we operate, we don't operate uh, in a silo. We operate in a global context. And uh, we particularly are operating right now in an era of uh, digital transformation. And uh, when we talk about uh, open content licensing, we probably need to look at it in the wider context of uh, the digital era and, and the digital transformation uh, that's uh, taking place. And so, and, and when we talk about uh, digital uh, publishing, again, as publishers, uh, we, we need to always remind ourselves, we are not talking about what's better between digital books versus uh, printed books, uh, because that's, that's really a very personal choice. I, I think uh, the, the consideration uh, the question probably we would be asking ourselves is what is the potential of um, digital books uh, you know, within the available markets? And uh, in, in the specific conversation we are having today is uh, would there be opportunities that open content licensing offers publishers as a new income stream or a new uh, way to generate revenues. Uh, let's first go back to um, the question of copyright uh, and, and information goods. 
the way we understand copyright is that it primarily treats um, information goods as economic objects. And, and, and that's why you know, the, there's a lot about the rights of the creator and, um, and, and their right to basically earn from their creations. Uh, however, copyright also uh, recognizes that info, uh, information goods are also creative objects. And that's why within the copy, copyright law, uh, there are exceptions of um, uh, fair use, for example, where uh, part of the content, uh, very specific, well-specified, would be used <clears throat> either for citations, uh, quotations, uh, for educational purposes, and uh, for research, and, and all that. So copyright also recognizes, apart from uh, information goods being economic objects, that they are also creative objects and makes those provisions. Now, in this regard, as publishers, I think we play a critical role, which is what I would consider like a dual role. Whereas we are business people, on the one hand, we are also cultural ambassadors. And, um, and, and those two roles uh, must probably be almost always foremost in, in our minds. Now, so when we consider what really motivates creators, now what copyright law, the copyright law does is to make provisions that um, try to incentivize creators to keep creating more because the more they create, then the more they earn and they have the, the, the freedom to earn. However, um, I think we all know, particularly in the era of uh, the digital era, that creators are not necessarily primarily motivated by economic reasons. And I think when you look at the amount of content created through social media, for example, uh, you know, people having their uh, blogs or vblogs uh, or lots of content generated every day on, on Twitter, on Facebook, and very many other uh, platforms, you, you recognize that there are other reasons for which people spend their time to create content and share it freely. And, and I'll mention just about three. Uh, one of it, of course, is, is, is freedom to do what they consider in their own thinking uh, is uh, meaningful work. Uh, and, and for some of them is probably that I am generating content uh, for very specific purposes, not necessarily economic. And, um, um, and, and the other one is freedom to play because most of uh, the social media, uh, you know, content generated every day, uh, you know, some of it is people just want to play with their ideas and with their creations. Uh, they want to have an opportunity to get a trigger from other people's work um, and, uh, you know, and, and build upon it. And, and I think I will give you an example at my first visit to the US 20 years ago, visited a very major publishing house and uh, you know, just asked the creative department that had hundreds of employees, how are you able to generate all these new, what seemingly is new ideas? And, and they told me, no, none, not all of them are necessarily new ideas. We go and scout out for what already in the market. And uh, you know, we, we don't just imitate it, but we innovate. Uh, from, from, from what's already there. And, and we use them as triggers for us to generate what you are calling uh, you know, new ideas. And uh, you know, the third reason that creators uh, uh, want to create uh, content, uh, apart from economic reason, is uh, again, uh, freedom through revenue generation. And, and I'm saying this, particularly considering as a publisher, the fact that um, most of the times we are constrained by very limited channels of uh, distribution. And, and we have very, you know, our own authors who are very creative, who are able to create their own channels of distribution and uh, very different ways of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of creating uh, followers and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and customers. And so they just want to have freedom from uh, sometimes what they, they, when, what they consider as very constrained, uh, you know, ways of generating revenues from traditional publishing. So those are motivations uh, that creators have. 
Now, the thing is, is that in, in our current dispensation, there is a growing movement of such creators who feel that information goods should have unbounded flow so that they can keep creating and borrowing from other people and other people building from their own ideas and so that the creative process uh, could continue. Now, consider also consumers uh, and, and governments. Um, on the other hand, consumers and government feel that content, uh, there is very high cost uh, attached to content and it acts as a barrier. And so they can't access information, uh, goods that they would want uh, because uh, it's not affordable. When you think about governments and say like a government uh, like Kenya, where you have free education and uh, yet uh, resources are limited. You can only allocate you know, so much, even when education has the biggest budget. Uh, the question is, uh, how do we ensure that uh, children in schools have access to as many books as they should have um, and, uh, and you know, at, 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 at a reasonable cost? So, uh, and, and again, when, where you have so many people poor, uh, over 50% in many uh, developing countries uh, in, you know, in, the, uh, in, in the bracket of people earning less than $1 a day, how, how, how can we make it uh, uh, the cost uh, not be a barrier to access to information? Uh, access is limited. Again, uh, opportunities for them to access, whether those are bookshops, whether those are libraries, and, and again, for uh, consumers and governments, is, is that there are certain underserved markets. And, and in my country, for example, uh, you will find that uh, probably uh, over 95% of all books uh, are in English or, and, and Kiswahili. And uh, less than 5% of books are in local languages, which, which, which are critical for, uh, you know, for, 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 the, for the country. So, and then for government, again, uh, they consider that a lot of money is poured into research and, and yet uh, the product of that research, which is um, the knowledge uh, generated and disseminated uh, through journals and through uh, books and, and all that, uh, are copyrighted materials and, and, and yet it was publicly funded. And, and so you, you find um, there are the interests of the creators there are the interests of consumers and the interests of, of government. And so the question really, um, as a publisher who has been considering open content licensing is, do I have sufficient reasons uh, for, for us uh, to consider this as an option uh, for uh, uh, generating revenues, given that the, the push from creators and consumers and, and governments is to either access it completely free uh, or for uh, minimal, at minimal cost. Now, our thesis as a company is that we believe that open content licensing, first of all, is not a replacement for copyright. And I think Neil dealt with that. And, and it's, it's when you consider open content licensing as a publisher, it is not an either or decision that you are making. Um, it is the genius of and. Uh, how do we continue developing our copyrighted materials and optimizing those opportunities that they present? But are there other opportunities that lie beneath open content licensing that we should also consider? And so we are not replacing copyright with open content licensing, but because there are creators, there are consumers, and there are governments pushing for this, we can't afford to shut those markets out. And so can we find opportunities of OCL while still generating revenues? The second thing we have had to um, uh, uh, agree on is that digital business is disrupting traditional business models. And um, as publishers, if we 
shall survive. And if we hope to do more than survive and thrive, we cannot ignore the changes that are taking place. And, and so we, we need to see what is the future going to look like, not even today, what's five years, 10 years, 20 years going to look like. Do we intend to still be in business? How do we adapt with the changes that are taking place uh, for us to be able to survive and thrive? So digital, uh, the digital transformation is a reality. How do we align uh, you know, to that reality so that we can be in business tomorrow? And the third reason that has given us, uh, the, the third th uh, reason uh, that has given us sufficient grounds to consider OCL is what I just said, that there are certain segments of the market we can't ignore, we can't ignore government. Uh, and, and it's a very big buyer, particularly in developing countries where over 85% of all materials developed are educational materials and, and government is the biggest buyer. And so um, if we have to respond to the needs of all segments of the market, then we must respond uh, to the needs, demands, and wants of, 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 of the big movement, movement uh, that, that wants to uh, have unbounded uh, access you know, to, to content. And, and the, fourth, uh, the fourth reason, uh, or the fourth ground for us, is, is we want to compete effectively in all markets. Now, as a trade publisher, it, it basically means that we have to do even more work because there is less money in trade publishing or general publishing um, in an environment where the reading culture is not very well developed. It basically means there is less demand uh, for books that are not feeding into or are not seen to feed into directly into the curriculum. And, um, and, 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 and so if we have to compete effectively in all markets, we realize that we cannot ignore the transformation that's taking place. And, and I think uh, these are four reasons that publishers uh, should seriously think about why they cannot uh, or we cannot ignore open content licensing. One is not an either or situation, it's the genius of and. Two is the reality of digital business transfer, uh, uh, disruption. And three is responding to the needs of and preferences of all segments. And, and the final one is basically uh, if we are to be to compete effectively in all markets. The process we have gone through in terms of uh, having this conversation with the, amongst ourselves um, is, 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 is probably what forms the next uh, part of our conversation. What decisions do publishers need to make before applying OCL? And I think the first one is basically a mentor shift, uh, is a paradigm shift. I think you know, one, one of our two presenters have already called it a paradigm shift. And, and, and we need to shift our focus from preserving content at all costs. Because in a digital uh, uh, environment, uh, you know, content actually is secondary, experience is primary. And, 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 and I think we need to see content uh, not as the ultimate thing that we must preserve at all costs, but it is the experiences that content provides that we might need to start shifting towards uh, in, in, a, in a digital era. And therefore, think how, what, if we were, for example, to offer our content free or at, at minimal cost, how else would we use that opportunity uh, to, to basically uh, make money and make our businesses uh, self-sustaining. How do we piggyback or leverage on those opportunities? I just want to show you an example of one of our uh, major publishers in Kenya and um, Longhorn publishers uh, have, have basically um, given uh, one of their premium products, which is Kamusi Akarne. This is a dictionary with over 50,000 headwords and um, it's uh, the Kiswahili dictionary um, and the English dictionaries are the top selling products um, in, in our part of the world. 
and, and, and basically they sell hundreds uh, of thousands of copies in a year. And, and they decided that they will actually offer it free of charge um, on, on an app. And, and uh, they decided that uh, we will generate revenues uh, by advertising and, uh, and, 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 and by driving, uh, it's like, a, uh, you know, by driving uh, traffic and, and buyers uh, to our platform uh, to experience other other products, and having a conversation with with, with them, they they indicate that they have had huge success with Kamusia Karine. Um, it's it's one of the most used uh, uh, you know dictionary Kiswahili dictionaries uh, in the content, and so they basically shifted uh, their focus from preserving uh, premium content. Um, that could make a lot of money and, and decided to uh, find uh, opportunities beneath uh, offering a content like this uh, as, as open content. Now, they still haven't uh, applied the uh, Creative Commons licenses. They say they're in the process, but it is actually completely free. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's just one local example. I think the second, uh, so the first decision really is to think differently. Think differently from our traditional uh, methods of, of doing business in publishing. I, I think that the second decision we, we would have to make is which of our titles should we offer under open content licensing? Because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a choice one has to make uh, as, as you, you know, we, we said copyright, uh, it plays a critical role um, in economic development. Uh, you know, people have, you know, choice is, is a very individual choice. And, 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 and so we are not offering all, uh, all, our, all our titles and, and, uh, uh, necessarily under uh, open content licensing. But so which ones? You have to be strategic. Longhorn decided they will take their premium content uh, and, and offer it as, uh, as uh, uh, under open uh, uh, licensing because they saw the opportunity for um, advertising. The third question, the third uh, decision uh, publishing house has to make is if you have, for example, illustrations or pictures or charts or any other content uh, within the title that is sub-licensed, uh, then obviously you, those need to be aligned because uh, you, you don't want to have copyright issues uh, uh, you know, on the content that is being offered uh, under open license. The fourth uh, uh, decision that has got to be made, uh, of course, is uh, the author, because uh, again, as a publishing house, you're, you're acting um, uh, uh, or by agency um, and, and you're acting on behalf of, of, of an author. And, and so you, the contract uh, with the author either would need to be revised, modified, uh, or, or getting a totally different uh, you know, uh, agreement. Uh, with, with the author. So those, those are basically four decisions that uh, have got to be made. I don't think I need to go through this because, um, you know, uh, Neil and have, have basically uh, talked about them, but I think the only reason that I, uh, the only part I may want to go through is when I went through uh, all the materials that commercial publishers uh, are offering, uh, there was almost a pattern. Uh, one is, uh, is non-commercial and uh, uh, non-derivative. -derivat and I was asked to say, to answer the question, why would publishers be making, the, particularly the non-derivative decision? Uh, for the non-commercial and non-derivative uh, uh, license, I, I think there are two things that publishers, commercial publishers would be considering here. One of them is, uh, you know, just asserting the moral right uh, of integrity. There are two moral rights of uh, paternity, that is uh, the right to be attributed as the creator of the work. But the second one is the moral integrity. Because, uh, you know, some publishers and authors feel that they still may want to uh, integrity of their work, uh, just in case they open it up and it goes directions that may question uh, their integrity. Uh, and, and the second one for uh, uh, is basically to restrict uh, competition with the commercial editions.
Now, the interesting one uh, was the, uh, the uh, attribution uh, non-commercial share alike. And, 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 and my own thinking and uh, having a conversation with uh, just one publisher who's applied this is, is basically that when they, you allow other people uh, to create derivatives of, of their work, then you also get an opportunity as a publishing house to learn um, and, and it feeds into your product development, uh, you know, to your intelligence gathering, uh, you know, to your research as, as to how else you could develop your own products. And, I so, and so I think uh, some publishers use, use that uh, as, as a learning, uh, as a learning uh, opportunity. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, what are some of the things that uh, principles that we can use uh, as publishers uh, in choosing titles for OCL? Uh, uh, one of them, I think, is uh, just asking three strategic questions. One of them is, does it fit, does open content licensing fit in the purpose of our business? When, when looking at our own uh, publishing business, Word Alive, now operating as uh, Book Talk Africa, in, uh, making content accessible to all, um, uh, those who can afford, those who can't afford, um, it, 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 it basically fits right into our purpose. We didn't even have to adjust our purpose. Uh, we, we, we did a tick that it does fit into our overall uh, purpose as, as, an, in, as, as a business. Uh, the second question is basically, what are the opportunities uh, that lie beneath uh, open content uh, licensing to our, to our business? And, and I think Neil talked uh, of uh, you know, offering content as a service. And, and because we have strength in that, we realize that it's possible to attract uh, resources we could not have attracted before, uh, you know, because then we, we can offer it as, as a service. Uh, we, we, can, we can advertise. Uh, or we, we can we can uh, you know provide other services around the open content uh, that that we provide. Uh, the third the third principle is basically how will implementing OCL help us to respond to the changes in the market? And I think as publishers, we need to constantly think about uh, responding to the changes in the market because if we are so rigid about our tradition, how we have always done things then the rest of the world will move fast and leave us. And we can't say that we're in Africa and, uh, because we are not immune. It's a globalized world. And we are not immune to the changes that are taking uh, place globally. And secondly is that uh, although our primary market is Africa, uh, we should always uh, have a greater vision of uh, you know, the, the wider world that the digital platforms uh, provide. And so finally, uh, tactics for publishers, um, which uh, uh, Longhorn has already used, open contenting, one version of, of a work, uh, sampler, chapter, or one title well, within a series, and uh, I will show how we are doing that. Open contenting to generate publicity. Uh, again, it's possible uh, you know, to have uh, open content uh, uh, copy that gets so popular that it pushes people to discover your other content uh, that that you know you're selling through under under copyright, value added services like uh, Longhorn has done, uh, and uh, for uh, Word Alive publishers, Book Talk Africa, we basically have made a choice. We have a series that we have already developed, uh, 18 titles, very highly popular. Uh, you know, within only a few months of uh, releasing the the, uh, the books, we've had uh, you know significant sales. Uh, on at least one of the titles that are sold, you know, close to 30,000 uh, 30, copies. Uh, you know, we have had just a major purchase on, 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 on the e-books, uh, but we have selected that we, we will use uh, one set uh, of, of the books uh, across six levels, and we will offer it as open content licensing, first of all, so that we can be on the learning curve, is so that we can explore what opportunities that will lie uh, under our offer of these titles under open content licensing and over a period of uh, 12 or so months we should have gathered data that will inform the choice of how uh, you know how wide do we go in spreading OCL uh, 
across more titles. Recommendations, I think, uh, for publishers is to seek uh, to gain a deep understanding of what it takes to build a, a publishing a house in a digital age. And, and, and I think this is quite critical. Uh, the second one is, um, uh, I think we really must look at the future. How is the future going to unfold five, 10 years, uh, 20 years from today? I think we need to build our own compelling view of how that future should unfold for us and what we need to do today uh, to prepare for that future. Uh, and the third one is, is, is we cannot uh, 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 afford not to develop a digital strategy uh, so that we can be ready for uh, the transformation that's already taking place. Thank you very much. Great presentation, David. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, everyone, for your patience. Uh, this was a very rich presentation by all three experts that we greatly appreciate. Um, I think the, the main uh, takeaways for us are that there really is opportunity uh, for uh, looking at the various levels of open licensing or creative commons rather, and um, that we are at the beginning of a new business model development process for this. There's a lot that we can learn as well as offer. Um, so I'm very grateful to all of the participants on uh, their presentations. I think this is going to be made available on the, the uh, GRM website. I would encourage you to share this broadly, widely with as many uh, of the, particularly in the publishing industry as possible. And we will of course continue to uh, engage in dialogue with you on this whole area of um, assisting publishers as they look to the future. Back to you, Limo. Thank you, Linda, for the wrap up. We'll be repeating this uh, webinar for the Asia region. Uh, in July 18th, uh, it will be mid afternoon in most of the countries in Africa. So for those who would like to uh, listen again to the webinar, they can join us on 17th with the Asia region and also uh, share this information with other publishers who could not be able to attend to our webinar today. Once again, thank you so much uh, for attending. Continue sending your questions and we'll share them with panelists to provide written answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Limo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.